I thank you for the reception that you gave Don Iverson this morning. Now tonight I'm going to preach and I am not a guest speaker. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been up here preaching to you, hasn't it? But I'm glad to be able to do that. And what I want to do this evening is continue on what we've been doing on Sunday nights. And this is not doing right. Did I hit the wrong button? There we go. Continue looking at those lessons that didn't be harder than preached almost, about 95, but almost 100 years ago in the old Ryman Auditorium. And the lesson tonight is Federalist and Anti-Federalist. As soon as I put that title up there, I'm not going to tell you who it was. I saw somebody yawn. I bet some of you are thinking, it's been a hard afternoon. I'm glad he's talking about that tonight because I need the rest. What are we talking about when we're saying Federalist and Anti-Federalist? Well, I'll tell you this about that title. Those are not biblical terms. In fact, they're not even religious terms. Those are political terms. And, and not only are they political terms, they are political terms that are now no longer used. Why in the world would somebody like N.B. Hardiman when they've been advertising all over Nashville for a gospel meeting, and they all come and fill the old Ryman Auditorium just to where there's only standing room only, and many did stand through those lessons, and he comes up and tries to talk about these extinct political terms when he could have been preaching the gospel. Well, I think as we get into this, you'll see what he's doing. What N.B. Hardiman was going to do this night, and what I'm going to do tonight, is explain those terms, Federalist and Anti-Federalist, and use that as an analogy that shows how we ought to approach the Scriptures. And it's really not a boring thing at all. Now, some people find history boring, but really it's fascinating. Did you know that when George Washington became the President of the United States, he was not a Democrat, and he was not a Republican. In fact, no one had ever heard of Democrats and Republicans. George Washington actually warned the nation about dividing up into political parties, and he didn't believe we ought to have political parties. And so he ran, I guess today we would call him an independent, but there really wasn't even anything to be independent of. He was just a citizen that had become the president of the United States with no political party affiliation whatsoever, our first president. We call him the father of our country. And what George Washington did as president, he fathered our country. He was first and he had the respect of our entire nation. And he reached out to all sides and tried to bring all sides in and saw that his major accomplishment was to get this country up and running. And that seemed to be his main interest as president. And he brought the most brilliant people he had into the government. He got Thomas Jefferson to be the Secretary of State. And for the Secretary of Treasury, he picked one of the most brilliant minds among those who, who we call our founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton. Now, Hamilton was brilliant. In fact, one of the first things Alexander Hamilton did was to convince Congress that they would take all the war debt away from all of the states and put it all into the federal government and that just won all the state's favor for what the federal government could do. And the federal government would pay that debt off over time through taxes and tariffs. Well, it set our nation on what was then a very sound financial footing. But Alexander Hamilton had another idea. He said the prosperity of our nation is going to depend largely on a strong economy. And I've got a way to make our economy sound. He thought it all up. He wrote it all out. He got to explaining it to the congressmen and senators in George Washington. He saw what Alexander Hamilton came up with, and he was in favor of it. 
establish a national bank and let that national bank be in control of America's economy. Oh, everybody thought this was going to be wonderful. But Thomas Jefferson said, wait just a minute. We've got a problem here. You see, we launched this nation as a constitutional republic. And that means the, the powers delegated from the people to the federal government are prescribed in our Constitution. And you can't just go around assuming you have authority to do things. And there's no provision in the Constitution for a national bank. Well, they got to debating that. And it started causing a faction between the, those that liked Hamilton's idea, calling themselves at that time Federalists, and those liking Jefferson's idea, calling them themselves at that time Anti-Federalists. And as that division grew, it turned into what we now have as political parties. Now, there's been a lot of changes down through the years. It looked like the Federalists were going to have their day. Uh, George Washington was in favor of it, and the president that followed him, John Adams, he was a Federalist. And then the nation elected Thomas Jefferson himself to be president, an anti-Federalist. How do you solve things like that? Well, there was a Supreme Court. And so when there were questions concerning the Constitution, they'd carry it up to the Supreme Court. These men would think about it, and they'd come up with their decisions, and, and they would be the ones to interpret that Constitution as what would be and what would not be allowed under the Constitution. And there's something else about that Constitution. is a human document. It wasn't perfect. In fact, the Constitution, as it was put together, they recognized from the beginning, this is not a perfect document. And so they made provisions for there to be amendments. And you can change what the Constitution was through the amendment process down through the years as you saw necessary. A human, imperfect document. And with such a thing, we might allow some liberties of interpretation by, based on the immediate need and the pragmatism of what is there. What really should we and should we not do here as the, the government? What should it do? <laughs> and the debate has raged down, and it occurs even to this day. In fact, sometimes we call them strict constructionists and then others of the more liberal constructionists when it comes to the Constitution. Well, now that's the analogy. Did the Constitution authorize a national bank? Alexander Hamilton said, there is nothing in the Constitution forbidding the establishment of a national bank. And Thomas Jefferson said, there's nothing allowing for it. So which way do we go? This is the analogy. There's a difference in an imperfect constitution and a perfect Word of God. How do we approach the Word of God? If there's something that we think might be a great idea and we in our human minds, as brilliant as we are, we come up with some wonderful proposal, does that mean we can do that religiously? What does the Bible say? And how would we handle this when it comes to, to the Bible? How are we going to approach the Bible on this? Well, let me tell you part of this analogy. When the Supreme Court has a case and they render a decision, that becomes a test case, a trial case. And once the Supreme Court has rendered its decision on one particular case, Every other case that comes up that's like that one is pretty much decided down through the years. They don't have to retry it and every now and then because we're all imperfect in this government thing and every now and then the Supreme Court will reverse their decision. Now God didn't do that. But there are test cases throughout the Bible that show us what is and is not authorized in God's law. 
And what I want to do tonight is go through some of those and see, you may have different political opinions about that and, and we can live with each other in that. When it comes to the Word of God, we're talking about the perfect law of liberty. And how do we approach this? I'll tell you one thing we do. We'll do it with reverence and godly fear. But now let's look at some of those test cases. There was a case long ago, back when Cain and Abel were, had just gotten out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had, and they had these two sons, Cain and Abel. And it tells us as early as the fourth chapter of Genesis, Genesis 4, 3 through 5, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his, his offering he had not respect. Now that's all we know about it when we go back and read Genesis. And we might wonder why is it that God respected what Abel did and did not respect what Cain did. Well we've got the New Testament. And the New Testament gives us some information that is not found in the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit gave us both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So hear what the Spirit said in the New Testament. Referring back to this case, the Holy Spirit says in Hebrews 11:4, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By the which he had taken witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You know what that means, he being dead yet speaketh? It means we're to learn from this. That case of Cain and Abel, that provides a precedent for us to understand how we're to approach the law of God. So what does it mean that Abel offered his sacrifice by faith? Well, Paul would write in Romans 10, 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Put all that together. What did Abel do? Abel had respect for God's word. That's what he did. Trust and obey. That's what we learn from Abel. Abel did what God told him to do. Cain did something different. God respected Abel's sacrifice. That's the sacrifice God said to make. He didn't have to forbid Cain's sacrifice. Cain did what he thought would be a brilliant idea in Cain's own mind. And to that God had not respect. That's the first case that sets us precedent on the reverence we're to pay toward God's perfect law. There's another case. Let's go to the case of Noah. God gave Noah some instructions. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. He's talking about the ark that Noah is to build. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubics, and the breadth of it 50 cubics, the height of it 30 cubics. And a window shalt thou make in the ark, and it a cubic shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark thou shalt set in the side thereof, with the lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. You know, that's some pretty good construction specifications, isn't it? On how Noah is to build the ark. One window, one door. Now, wait, wait a minute. He didn't say you couldn't have two windows, but he did say one. He didn't say you couldn't have two doors. What about putting a back door into that ark? No. God said one. Well, what about this 300 cubics? Well, that doesn't mean 299. And it doesn't mean 301, does it? 300 cubics. Now, I know that Noah built that ark 300 and cubics long. I know he did it. Because it says in Genesis 6, 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now I say all that without even mentioning the gopher wood. Have you ever heard the story of the gopher wood? You probably have. 
every now and then you'll get these smart fellows that uh, think because they've been to theological seminary that, that they don't like to hear about this gopher wood. In fact, sometimes they'll call us gopher wood preachers. Well, they're saying that in ridicule. Well, let me tell you something. The gopher wood is in there. It's in the verse just before this one in 15. It's in Genesis 6, 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall fell making the ark, shall pitch it within and without the pitch. Now, Noah was told the kind of wood to use. That was in the covenant that God gave. And we don't read where God said, don't use this wood and don't use that wood. And don't. He said, go for wood. And I know the kind of wood that Noah used. Noah built that ark out of gopher wood because that same verse says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. So when God specifies a certain thing, he doesn't have to go around saying, Now, now don't do this, don't do that. Now sometimes he does because we are dull of hearing. But he doesn't have to. It's enough to know. Make it out of gopher wood. And so that's the wood Noah was to use. You see, the old law was the law of God. And God didn't allow man to change his law. It tells us in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, there's a clause in the old law that God gave Moses that sealed that law up so that man could not just change it at his will. Ye shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you. And then to make sure we got it, <laughs> he said it again in Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Now that was for man. Man couldn't sit here and read God's law and say, well, it doesn't say not to. Or, you know, really, we think this would be a good idea. We ought to do this. And say, he didn't give man that prerogative. Now, it is true that God made a change of the law when Christ came, but it was God's law to change. It's not for man to change God's law to suit himself. It's for man to listen to what God says and follow through exactly as he says it to the very best of our ability. Now, Nadab and Abihu lived under that law, and we see how serious this is. It tells us in Leviticus 1 and verse 17, The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. You see, the first time that they did this, the fire from the altar came from heaven itself. God sent the fire down from heaven and lit that fire. And that was the fire to consume the sacrifice. And we read that God told them among those who would carry that tabernacle through the wilderness from place to place, there were among those sons of Levi those that would take the coals of that fire and keep those coals burning and hot as they carried that. And then when they re-erected the thing and, and had their worship again, that's the fire they would use for the next offering and the next incense and the next sacrifice, those coals that God had originally kindled. But then we read over, I say Genesis 10. This is Leviticus 10, okay? Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Okay, we got the right people doing the sacrifice. Sons of Aaron. But they took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Look at that case. God says don't add to or diminish from it. And when Nadab and Abihu took their liberties, God destroyed them. You don't treat holy things that way. This is my law, and you sanctify me. 
before men and treat this thing as holy because this is the perfect law. It's not like some constitution that man came up with knowing when they did it. That, now we might have to change this and it may not always fit and we'll have to figure this out. No, this comes from God. We don't change this law. Now I want you to notice he didn't command them not to use that fire. He was just silent about it. It's fire which he commanded not. There was no provision in the constitution of that old law for any other fire than that which God specified. And when it calls it strange, fire. It didn't mean there was something weird about fire. Fire is pretty much fire, but it had to do with the source. I think it's interesting. The New International Version is not a translation of the Bible that I recommend. But in this instance, it's very interesting what the translators did. For in the King James Version, they said strange fire. In the New International Version, it is called unauthorized fire. Now that tells us, doesn't it? When we do something under God's law, we need to have the authority for what God says. And we don't derive that authority from what it does not say, but from what it teaches. There's this case of Saul and the Amalekites. You see, the Amalekites, as the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness, and they had all these treasures of Egypt, and the Amalekites, they said, hey, we got a chance to take these treasures ourselves. And they took advantage of those vulnerable people in the wilderness and attacked them. Remember, this is the time that Moses had to hold up his hands until they got weary, and Aaron and Hur held his hands up so they would defeat the Amalekites under the leadership of Joshua. God promised at that time, one of these days, I'm going to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And when Saul became the king in Israel, God decided the time was now. And he gave a command to Saul that would cause us to shiver. He said, now go smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman and infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and ass. <laughs> Nothing left. This is the wrath of God. And it was up to Saul to carry this out. Well, here's how the story goes. 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur. That is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. You see, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. Something about kings, they don't really like kings getting killed off. And kings will spare kings sometimes and they'll destroy all the people. What Saul did, they spared the king. And not only that, they saved the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they utterly destroyed. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, What did God think of this? He said, It repenteth me that I have set Saul up to be king, for he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Samuel said unto him, Saul said to him, Blessed thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now watch that. I should have highlighted this. Did you see what God said? God said in that third line that he has not performed my commandments. What did Saul say? Saul said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Who was right? 
the Lord was right and Saul got it wrong. And Saul may have even thought within himself, boy, I've done a good job here. I've really done it. But God says, no, you have not. You have used your own brilliance and your own decision right in the face. What I told you about destroying utterly the Amalekites. Samuel said, Saul, Saul, what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? I mean, the evidence is all against it. So how can you say I have done this when I hear these sheep and I hear that, I hear that oxen out there? Whoa, that, that doesn't sound like it's destroyed. Saul said, they had brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord and the rest we've utterly destroyed. Now listen, you can't say, well, now I know that's wrong, but the rest of it's all right, so I'm going to go with the rest, and I will just tolerate this wrong. No, that's not how you treat God's law, and that didn't spare Saul. And that's when Samuel told Saul, God's going to take this kingdom away from you and give it to someone that is better. God sought a man after his own heart. Well, what if God changes the law? You know, sometime God will say, now this is what I want you to do this time. And then later he'll say, I want you to do this this time. And some people, what they'll do, they'll go back to something God said earlier and say, I want to do it the way we did it before. People this will do this a lot, a lot of times, when it comes to the New Testament and the Old Testament. Well, they'll come to the New Testament and they'll read in there, well... It doesn't say anything about burning incense, but they did it under that law, and I really like that. We're going, we'll, we'll just do what, that, what he said back then instead of what he says now. And it, it doesn't say anything here about infant membership, but, but man, they had that back in the old law, and, and we like, we're going to bring that, we'll just do that, because he said it once. It doesn't say anything here about playing harps while we worship. Or, but you know, they did that back in the old days. They did that. Didn't David do that? If they did it under the old law, we ought to be able to do it under the new. And ignore this fact that sometimes God will tell it one way, but then things change. And God says, okay, now I want you to do it this way. And we have to do what God says for us in our time and not what God said for someone else in another time. Now there's a case that demonstrates this. The children of Israel in the wilderness and they got to moaning and complaining because they didn't have anything to drink. They were thirsty. And here's what God says in Exodus 17, 9. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. You know what that means? Moses smote the rock. And when he did, the water came forth. Well, he did what God told him to do, didn't he? But later, they got thirsty again. And they were a long way from that rock. Well, God gave Moses some other instructions. And I want you to notice the change. Numbers 27 and 8. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring them forth the water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast water to drink. Well, look at the difference. Smite, that's the way he told them the first time. But the second time, what did he say? He said, speak. Now the words sound a lot alike, but there's a difference in smite and speak. You know the word silo means to strike? That's what it means. When, it, when you read in the Bible how David would silo his heart, you know what he did? He struck the strings. That made the string vibrate and send forth the music out of the heart. 
Under the old law, God said, strike. What does he say under the new law? Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And if you want to strike something, make the melody in your heart. That's the heart. Not the harp. The heart. And don't strike. Speak. You see the difference? Boy, preacher, you're really straining now, aren't you? Well, let's see how this test case came out. God told Moses, now you strike the rock. But this time he didn't say anything about strike. Now, he didn't tell him not to. But he told him to speak. And when it came to striking, he was entirely silent about it. Look what Moses did. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. So far, so good. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch water for you out of the rock? Sounds like to me Moses is pretty upset with those people, doesn't it? Here now, ye rebels, can't you just hear him getting on to them? And instead shall the Lord bring forth water. He says, Shall we bring you water out of the rock? Moses lifted up his hand with his rock and he smote the rock twice. He didn't speak to the rock. He spoke to the people. He took that rod and he hit that rock. Well, nothing happened. That ought to tell you something, shouldn't it? Moses hit it again. And this time the water came forth. But God was not pleased. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank the beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. You didn't sanctify me. You didn't show me the respect that was due to me as the Lord. You didn't treat my word as that which was holy. Moses, you took it upon yourself to do what you wanted to do. And you may have based it on what I said earlier. But this time you're supposed to speak. And just because you got all upset about it didn't justify it, did it? So we got to be careful when it comes to the law of the Lord. What about the man that picked up sticks? You know, that seems like a minor thing. A lot of time people look at God's law and they see what it says. Yeah, but that seems like such a little thing. And sticks aren't very much. They're kind of little things, aren't they? While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found the man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathered sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they put him in a ward because it was not declared what should be done unto him. And the Lord said to Moses, This man shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and they stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. You better be careful when it comes to the law of God. And don't be saying, oh, but that's a minor thing, and I'm going to focus on major things and not minor things, and if it's in God's law, who are we to say this part of God's law is not important, but this part is? We better be careful. We're talking about the perfect law of God and not some, some flawed law of man. Someone says, yeah, but all those are Old Testament examples. Now we're into the New Covenant, and, and we know all about grace, and we don't have to be so careful with the New Covenant like we were with that Old Covenant. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Turn to the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3 begins. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time 
time we should let them slip. For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just back compense of reward. That's how it was under the old law. Now he says this, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Let's not get ourselves too uppity and haughty when it comes to the law of God of all things, yea, barely, even because of what we know about the grace of God. We ought to try to be very careful to do all things and give even more earnest heed to the things which he has told us by his son than they did under that old law delivered by angels. There's an interesting passage in 2 John verse 9. There's no chapters in 2 John, just verses. 2 John 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. That word transgresseth, you know what that means? It means you keep in your boundaries. Well, we have another word similar to that called trespassing. I saw a sign this morning on the way to work. Somebody nailed it to a tree. said, no trespassing. I know what that sign means. It means I've got a border here. And you don't come across that border onto my land. You stay out. No trespassing, okay? Well, the word transgress is like that, only it's switched around. That means you stay within these borders. To trespass is to go out from the outside to the inside. To transgress is to go from the inside to the outside. You know, if cows could read and you could teach them to be obedient, you wouldn't have to put up fences. You'd just nail up signs and they would say, no, tra no trans trans transgression. And the cow, dumb as he is, he'd read that sign and know, oh, well, I'm not supposed to go over there. And that'd be better than the fence. But, but see, we are more intelligent than cows. And when it says no transgression, we ought to recognize now there's a border. And we're not going to go beyond that. And so that tells us how to approach God's law. We don't take liberties with God's law. When God has established the borders and the boundaries of his authority, we don't get out there and try to do test cases to see how, how, how far we can go with it. No, don't transgress. Don't go beyond those borders. Let me bring this sermon to a close. Well, we N.B. Hardeman brought this sermon to a close nearly a hundred years ago. And at the end of this, we'll have the invitation, because that's what N.B. Hardeman is giving us here. So let's be ready to sing the invitation song. We claim to be nothing under the shining realm except Christians. Christians only. We stand pledged to the idea of speaking where the Bible speaks and keeping silent where God's book is silent. This gives the only possible basis for Christian unity and for its accomplishment under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Our earnest prayers are constantly ascending toward the throne of God. I ask in conclusion tonight, if there are all those in this splendid company who have given such fine attention and has evidenced that splendid interest that want to become Christians, and only that, I want you to join no organization, no body, no party unknown to the book of God. I want you to wear no name other than the name Christian. I want you to accept no creed other than the Bible, which is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. It is my good pleasure, once more, extend to you this gospel call.